Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Thanks, Trav. I'm glad you're here, too. But you've lost all deniability now. You had that going for you before. Um, I just thought it was you wanted to give me passages you didn't want to teach. Um, There was that, like, 40 minutes you gave me to teach about the reliability of scriptures, the canon, how that came together. And then that one time you said, hey, how about a theology of creation? So, and then today I get Romans 7, so we keep that trend going right there. Um, we will be back in the Book of Romans this morning, but before we jump in, one, I want to just thank you all for your response on Orphan Sunday, um, taking the tags, bringing gift cards. I, I don't know if uh, we as a church can really grasp what that will mean to some of these foster teens uh, to feel blessed by others they don't know, um, because a lot of them don't feel blessed by the people they do know. And also, I want to say thank you, Danny, for last week, and thank you for going for it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I will ever look at a day in the life of Danny again quite the same way or the voices of former boyfriends. So, and, and if you don't know what I'm talking about because you missed it, please go on the app, listen to it. You're welcome. Like I said, we're going to be in Romans 7. We're going to be completing the chapter as part of our ongoing series in Romans. But I um, wanted to kind of take a little bit of a sidebar before we get there and, and kind of recap where we've been. If you're like me, my attention span doesn't go much more than maybe a day or two. My memory, maybe not even that quite that far. And we've been in Romans a good, oh, seven, eight weeks now. And so before we jump into seven, uh, we're going to kind of swing back and take a look at where we've been. And we're going to go all the way back to starting with who's Paul. Uh, Paul was, was born uh, with the name Saul. Uh, he was of a, a respectable lineage. Uh, he was a Jew Uh, that was well-respected for his ability to keep the law, for his knowledge, for his ability. Um, And he was so passionate about the law and about the Jewish faith uh, that he persecuted believers. He persecuted the early church. He was a part of the death of some of the early followers of Christ because he was so passionate about maintaining the integrity of Judaism and about making sure that his people didn't get crosswise again with God. That's who Saul was. And then he met Jesus. And he met Jesus. And that turned everything around. It, it changed everything for him. So much so, he was even given a new name. Uh, maybe some of you all can relate with that. That when you met Jesus, he gave you a new name. You were no longer failure, you were beloved. You were no longer covered, and you you are no longer covered by whatever shame dominated you before meeting Jesus. For Paul, that was actually manifested in a new name that God gave him. You are now Paul. And from that point forward, when he met Jesus, he became all about the work of Jesus. Traveling the known world, risking his life, spreading the good news of what is going on now. And he, being a... um, a, a, a Jew, uh, growing up in a Jewish family, understanding the law, having been so devout, he understood after he met Jesus how everything that he had learned as a child, everything that he had learned as an adult pointed toward this Messiah, and this Messiah had come. Romans is a letter, it's the longest letter that Paul wrote to the house churches and the early followers of Jesus in Rome. Now, up until this point, he writes the letter, people think roughly 58 A.D. Uh, we don't really think that too many of um, the early like, kind of disciples or followers of Jesus uh, made their way to Rome to start these house churches. Uh, history more tells us that we believe that the house churches in Rome formed from people who were uh, part of the Acts 2 kind of Pentecost experience that happened there. Um, returning back to their home. If you're not familiar with Acts chapter 2 and the story of Pentecost, basically what what happens there is um, not long after Jesus rises from the dead, there is a gathering for a Jewish festival in the city of Jerusalem. 
uh, the Feast of Weeks, um, also known as the Harvest Feast. It's one of the many uh, kind of ritualistic celebrations that devout Jews from across the known world were, were, were to come back to Jerusalem to celebrate this. And as a part of this Feast of Weeks, they had to bring a grain offering. It was just, it was kind of part of the pattern. Um, and again, we can look back now and see this all pointed toward the Messiah. But at the time, for those who came to Jerusalem during the day of Pentecost, during this Feast of Weeks, this was just kind of part of the routine. Hey, we're doing what's asked of us. We're doing what's asked of us. But if you're familiar with the story, you know this wasn't like any other Feast of Weeks celebration. Uh, that this is, oh, roughly, uh, gosh, a good 50 days after the resurrection. Which, interestingly enough, in- interestingly enough Pentecost means 50. 50 days. And so this celebration is going on roughly 50 days after the resurrection, after Jesus rose from the dead. And you've got this group of Jews in Jerusalem for this celebration who then hear Peter just break out in one of the greatest sermons known to man. Just bold. Incredibly bold. And that day that Peter broke out with that sermon, that day of Pentecost was also the day that the Holy Spirit falls on followers of Christ and marks the beginning of the ministry of the disciples to take this good news to the known world and beyond. I I don't, whenever I see pattern or kind of foreshadowing and fulfillment or kind of just like a rhythm in the Bible, I I don't think it's random. And so I want to share a few things that I think could even like kind of increase our wonder like what happened there in Pentecost. So that word Pentecost, that means 50. Uh, that Feast of Weeks is, again, it's, it's, one, it's, it's one of what are called the Solemn Feasts. So you have like Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles, all these Old Testament feasts. And it was a day that was also known as the Day of First Fruits where they would kind of offer the best of their harvest. They would offer the first fruits of their harvest up. And so 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, which is actually when Jesus rose from the dead, you then come to the Day of First Fruits, the Day of Pentecost. And while Jews are there thinking, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm offering my, my grain as part of what's going to, you know, point toward the Messiah someday, guess who shows up? The Spirit of the Messiah to fall upon his people. There were 3,000 strong that came to know Jesus that day in the city of Jerusalem, Acts 2 tells us. Uh, from every kind of part of the known world, a smattering of Jews who had come from all over, and many of them, within a short period of time, then returned home. And that's what most point to as the origins of these house churches in Rome. Uh, Jews that were in Jerusalem, that received the Spirit, heard Peter's radical sermon, and then went home probably thinking like, what do I do now? Like, I just met Jesus. Everything's a little bit different here. And they go back to, in in, in Rome, being a prominent city, um, being a very large city, had very segmented racial communities. And so these Jews return, they're back in their Jewish community, they're going back to their Jewish synagogues, they're they're like back in the midst of like what for them used to be a very normal life, but okay, they met Jesus. What, what are they going to do with this? And it doesn't take long uh, to, to see historians begin to write that in these early house churches, even in like these kind of little Jewish communities, there's Gentiles being welcomed and they're spreading and the numbers are growing of people trying to follow Jesus in the midst of figuring out what in the world do I do now? But there's more to the context of who Paul's writing to. So um, in AD 40, uh, Claudius, who was an emperor in uh, Rome, got really upset the Jews and kicked them all out of the city in 40 AD. He dies about 14 years later, and the new emperor lets them all back in. So in about 40 AD, we, we know that the house churches were definitely a mix of Jews and Gentiles, and, and largely kind of led by Jewish Christians because they had a little more experience with the law. Many of them were the ones from Pentecost coming in there. Well, in 40 AD, they're all kicked out, and now that the the Gentile believers are left, and if you know anything of history about the difference in lifestyle between Jews and Gentiles, it didn't quite look the same. And so then 14 years later, the Jews come back to Rome. They come back to their homes, kind of pulling back into their their church community, their house churches, and um, we know there's some friction going on here. There was some tension it was like, hey, well, how, how really are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? What's the place of all your custom where, where we don't have that custom? Who's right? Who's wrong? How do we celebrate together? What do we eat? How do we, how do, we do this? And so Paul, a few years after 
the return of Jews into Rome and kind of just the, the kind of tension growing and the need for direction growing, he writes this letter, the longest letter of all of his works. And he writes this with the expectation that he, he believes he is going to Rome soon. It was on his heart. But he wants this letter there as a forerunner to kind of kind of lay the foundation. Um, and it is, again, I'm, I'm glad that Beans is helping us understand Rome because we, we definitely need it because this is, it is a deep letter. Um, for you literary buffs, if you're looking for the thesis of this letter, I'd point you to Romans 1.16. Um, and, and the good news about that is if you don't know Romans 1.16, but you have kids here, ask them. Because in Radiant Kids, we've been working on memorizing this for a long time now. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. I mean, that really is the theme of the entire letter. Paul saying that, hey, I, this, this good news that Jesus brought, there's, I'm not ashamed of it. I'll proclaim it while they throw rocks at me. Because it actually brings salvation. It actually saves the Jew and the Gentile both. Which now, I'm hoping, considering what I've told you about kind of the backdrop of what's going on in the house churches in Rome, you know why he mentions them both separately. And that will be important because Romans 7, where we're going to be today, speaks of the law, the Mosaic law. Um, And understanding kind of this dynamic will also be important there. But let's do a little brief summary. So right after Paul gives this statement in Romans 1.16, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe. Two verses later in 18, we, we see the wrath. Because Paul begins to build his case that uh, neither Jew nor Gentile have gotten themselves excused from God's wrath. That it's coming to all of us. Whether you have even respected and revered the law and tried to follow it, or you could care less and are doing whatever you want to do, we've all learned wrath. And the picture is bleak. But as Trav shared when he spent a whole sermon on God's wrath, which um, was, was pretty amazing and pretty uncommon, um, but, but very well done, uh, as he shared, sometimes you have to know how bad the bad news is to really appreciate the good news. And when... Um, uh, Deborah and I, uh, well, actually, Deborah was pregnant. I was not pregnant. Deborah was pregnant with our second little boy, Avery, who's four now. His first ultrasound came back with some things in there that, that were just, uh, they weren't confirming of something that's really wrong, but they allowed for suspicion that something could be wrong. And it was a number of weeks until the next, one, uh, next ultrasound where they confirmed, that, oh, that was kind of a false read. There's nothing wrong. But for us to appreciate health, we had to kind of live in the reality that we may be without it. Yes. And, and I feel like God often wants us to understand sometimes the, like the, the weight of sin and, and just the reality of his wrath to really be able to start trying with our little brains to grasp how beautiful his grace is. Romans three twenty and 21, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But, and I've said this before, but there are times where seeing a but in the Bible is a really, really good thing because it brings hope. And here's one of them. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. As Paul kind of like takes off in his letter, he's got to level the playing field that all are due God's wrath. And yet, that is not the state in which we live in. Because God took a step to make us righteous. Romans 4 then goes on to kind of point to faith. Because again, think of the audience here listening to this. Um, A a largely Jewish audience there in Rome who has, for the entirety of their lives, looked at the law and been told, hey, line up to the law. Like this is is a good thing. This This is God's standard. And they knew from their history 
Uh, and even for some of them, why they were living in Rome and not all kind of huddled together in Israel, they knew that disobedience to the law had consequences. Exile, captivity, dispersion, death, pain. And so chapter 4 in Romans is so key because Paul goes all the way back to Abraham to say, hey, from the beginning it was by faith. Even Abraham had faith and it was credited to him as righteousness. So don't think that God's now kind of changed his mind. He's like, hey, plan B. Plan A didn't work. Like tablets come down the mountain. Good, we're going to be good. They're going to listen. We're great. Tablets get broken because people are upset and angry. Ah, plan B. What's plan B? What's plan B? Faith. Let's try faith. Let's try faith instead. No, no, that was never the intent. That was never the intent. And talking about the law today, we will talk about what the law was for. And then as we get closer and closer to chapter 7, 5 and 6, if you uh, remember, uh, in addition to Danny's beautiful examples, 5 and 6 really highlight the prominence of grace. And uh, just the beautiful reality that we, because of what God has done, because of his grace, we get right with God as an undeserving sinner. And we learn to serve him in an entirely new way. We don't relate to God through his law. We don't relate to God through a list or through rules or through what I should do or shouldn't do. But we get to relate to him in an entirely new way having to do with the spirit of Christ placed within us, him indwelling us. And it's by his grace. And his grace is primary. His grace is secondary. I mean, it's like all the way through. It's not that grace is a part of it. It's his grace. It is his, it is his unmerited favor. It is what he has done. And Paul goes so far with pressing grace that in chapter 6, he actually turns to defend grace. And he has to defend grace largely because of what he said in Romans 5, 20 and 21. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he makes this statement that you think you've out God? I'm sorry, you haven't. That even where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And so Paul then in chapter 6 says, hey, okay, now I need to defend grace because he's hearing the murmurings. Well, if grace is so wonderful, if there's so much grace, and if when sin increases, grace increases, well, let's just keep on sinning. And Paul knows he has people who are critics saying, hey, hey, Paul, your whole, like, message here, you're enabling people to game the system. You're enabling people to say, hey, I, I've been declared righteous by grace. That's what it means to be justified, to be declared righteous, to have God positionally say, hey, you know, Tom, Josie, you are righteous, like to be declared that. If, if that's completely by grace, and Paul, you're saying that even then where there's some sin in there, grace just increases all the more, well, people are just going to take advantage of this and say, hey, I'm good. Let me just go on doing my thing, and immorality is going to increase, and, and what a mockery is going to be made of Jesus. So then in chapter 6, Paul makes this defense. And he uses a similar technique we're going to see in 7 where he kind of asks that rhetorical question, you know, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. And that's kind of our sanitized translation of that. Um, in, in literary terms, it's called a violent negative, which again bridges on kind of like a cuss word alongside it. Um, use your imaginations. And then he makes this defense just to say that, okay, if, if this was the case, if you could really game the system, why would you consider it gaming the system or taking advantage of the system to re-enslave yourself to that which wants your death? Like, what benefit are you going to get from that? And you guys ever worked for a boss that you were sure that boss wanted you to fail? You guys ever had a supervisor or a boss like that that you went to work thinking, like, the cards are stacked against me to start the day. Like, they're, they're trying to trip me up. They want to write me up. They want to suspend me. I mean, how much fun is that? And that's kind of a, a reflection of what Paul's saying here. That if grace allows us to game the system, then I think we've misunderstood what it means to be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And somehow we don't have eyes wide open on the reality of what our experience is actually like when we're a slave to sin. 
And if someone's experienced the very grace of God and the satisfaction that comes in Jesus, why in the world would they want to run back to the thing that ends in death? When you've experienced the coolness of, 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 of nice water on your lips when you're thirsty, why in the world would you again drink a cup of sand? But grace isn't the only thing that Paul's going to defend here in the middle of Romans. That's what we get to in chapter 7. He then takes up the defense of the law. How many of you this morning started your devotion time in, in the Old Testament law? Yeah, probably not too. Oh, Tom, hey, well, that just kills my exam. No, I was kidding. No. Uh, prob- probably not too many. Um, because of that and because a lot of today's message is going to be about the law. We're going to start with a little video here done by the Bible Project um, to kind of give us more of a context and a view of how the law plays into the grand story of what God has done and is doing. So let's cue up the video. Hope that provides a little bit more context to this reference to law. And so just thinking of that too, can you imagine now when those um, Jews who came from Rome to Pentecost and went back, when they got home and they're like, hey, remember that Messiah that we've been reading about in, in the prophets? He's here. Like he, he's done it. Like can you imagine the excitement? Because again, you know, these were, these were men with families who um, I'm sure every year as they're getting ready to leave to go to Jerusalem for this pilgrimage, the kid's like, hey, Daddy, why are you going? Why are you going? Well, son, remember, we got to go do this because it's part of this thing about the Messiah coming. Well, now when they come home, it's like, hey, I'm not going next year. Why? The Messiah's come. So I just, I think just understanding the center point of the law within Jewish history is really important for us then to also understand that statement and the power of that statement in Romans 7, verse 4, when Paul says, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who's been raised for the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. That was kind of the idea that we were, we were left with at the end of the last week that law keeping is powerless to make you like God. It's powerless to bear fruit. But being united to the one who fulfilled the law in its entirety and who gave his life for you that is the very beginning of being able to bear fruit, to have a life that reflects the Messiah, to have a life that pleases God and that lines up with the law. But Paul knew that his references to the law had been so much largely uh, negative and not positive that he had to defend it or else find himself with his kind of Jewish believing audience or, or the Jewish Christians that were listening of, well, is Paul saying the law is bad? Because Jesus himself, I'm pretty sure he said that uh, the law is not going to pass away, but he came to fulfill it. And I'm pretty sure our entire Old Testament, Old Testament points to the law as good and holy and, and righteous. So it's Paul at odds here. So Paul has to make the distinction we see. So let's go, and we're going to read uh, chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, and then we'll get to the, the last part as well. Romans chapter 7, starting verse 7. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? Again, that rhetorical question idea. By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So here then is Paul's defense of the law, of what it it is and why the law is valuable and it's important. And really he points to it in relation to our experience with sin. Why is the law valuable? Number one, you see in verse 7, it exposes sin. It exposes sin. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. 
Um, I, I think all of us would agree that kind of self-awareness of, of our issues is a good thing. Um, I think we can, we, we, we recognize and sometimes are a bit kind of taken aback by those who are not self-aware. Um, but this goes even deeper than that. This goes even deeper than that. That um, while we didn't wake up this morning, I think, desiring to be exposed, the reality that the law exposes our sin is a good thing because it drives us to our need. And in, in, this, in the context that we get to live in, where the law exposes our sin, we're driven to a need that we also find from God the satisfaction of that need. Because to expose somebody's need without the ability to satisfy or to address it is, is actually kind of cruel often. You bring, you bring a suffering that, that is just wrought with despair. But to have our sin exposed and then alongside that to find we are loved by a God who declares us righteous, that is a gracious act of God that frees us to look full on at what is inside and not, and not fear that that failure is fatal or final for us. Because it's not. And what's interesting, the second part of verse 7, Paul uses the example, for I would not have known what it is to covet had the law not said you shall not covet. You shall not covet, that's the 10th commandment. What I find interesting is he points to the law, not just exposing our sin, like, okay, if the law says don't have any other idols and your neighbor looks over and you got like a little bail thing going on there, hey, great, I can see that. But the law is actually so powerful, it can get to the innermost parts of your heart because covetousness is the hardest of the sins outlined in the Ten Commandments to see. Like, I can't tell right now if Tom is coveting my Nikes. I can't. He could just be nodding his head and agreeing with what I'm saying, or he could be nodding his head thinking, like, I like those shoes. Mm-hmm. Wish I had those shoes. How did he get those shoes? So the law is so powerful, it can dive deep into the innermost of who we are to expose what is deep down that sometimes we ourselves don't even fully understand. And how gracious is our Lord again that he would expose our sin alongside providing us the satisfaction of the need we see in himself. So what else does the law good for? Verse 8, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. The law also provokes sin. It awakes what's sleeping beneath. Um, there's a, a, a fair number of times throughout the week that we find uh, our little boys who are seven and four trying to go to sleep in, in our bed. You know, maybe like night we have pack when Deborah's got to put the boys down because I have pack with, with a group of guys in our living room. And to kind of get them to sleep without talking for hours, like we'll let them go in our bed, but like put like a line of pillows down the middle. And what's always really funny to watch is they're totally cool on both sides. The line of pillows goes down and arms and legs are crossed and trying to hit each other. Why is it that when a line is drawn, all we are trying to do is cross it? We see it with Adam and Eve, right? When did they eat the fruit that was forbidden? It was after they found out it was forbidden. We don't read that before that it was like their favorite tree. We don't even read before that they were like, like terribly enamored with this tree. And yet then the, the commandment comes and right away it's like the, ooh, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm interested now. What is this thing? How about with Israel? They talked about in the Bible Project video, when did they make the golden calf? Exodus 32. When did they learn don't make idols? Exodus 20. So it wasn't until after like the definition was given to like where, where the line is that they just couldn't help themselves. And their impatience did something that we look at. That's stupid. Why would they do that? But for those of you who've been married for a while, um, how much better do you know your spouse now than when you were dating? Quite well, right? And how much more now do you know the line that if you cross, irritation and fury are soon to follow? And yet how often then do you choose to cross that line thinking, oh, I'm going to prove a point anyway, and then later think like, that wasn't worth it. No, 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 it was not worth it. <laughs> it's like deep within us, right? It's deep within us. The law provokes sin. Verse 11, we see another quality of this relationship of the law and sin. And really, this is more just something I'll, I'll point out about a characteristic of sin. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. One other little nugget here is that sin is deceptive. 
It's quite deceptive. Um, sin, uh, temptation, and this indwelling sin within us, often it makes promises and brings promises to our thoughts that it cannot keep. It writes checks it cannot cash. Hey, I know that that looks dangerous, but it's worth it. And so Paul concludes this section, verse 12, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now, there is some debate about who the I is in this little portion. Um, and, and, and you might be thinking like, well, of course it's Paul, right? It's I. Like when I write with I, it's, I mean me. Well, the rest of the book of Romans is largely written in kind of like more corporate language, we and us and whatnot. Chapter 7 takes a bit of a different spin, and we see more I, me's, and my's. And most think that this is Paul kind of using a different style to create a point, but not necessarily using the I of the standpoint of like, hey, me, Paul, today as I'm writing this as a follower of Christ. So some have wondered, like, well, who, whose experience is he describing here? Some various thoughts on that. Something, maybe it's Paul as describing his experience as a young Jewish boy. Because you know, he, he makes the, the reference, I was once alive apart from the law. So think, oh, maybe this is Paul talking about what he experienced before he was old enough to really be of accountability and understand. Um, there's a lot of holes in, in, in that thought process we won't go into today. Some have said, hey, it's Adam and Eve in the garden maybe, that before the law came, and there's examples I gave of them here that you know, maybe, maybe this is like the Adam and Eve experience, talking about the relationship of law and sin and what the law did all the way back then. Some say maybe it's Israel he's talking about. He's personifying himself as Israel in this. Um, we're, at, we're not going to dive deep into who this is today because really for us, I don't think it's of great importance. I think more what we can see here is to understand um, the indwelling sin within us and the qualities of it. Uh, Paul himself talks about it. It's good to not be ignorant of sin. It's good to not be ignorant of the opposition we face, uh, lest it overtake us when we're, we're not expecting it or lest we take it lightly. And I'm not here to try to scare you guys about sin, but I, I would like us all to be eyes wide open that, that um, sin is tempting. Sin is deceptive. Uh, that we will wrestle with it and struggle with it. And if we don't take it seriously, um, then, yeah, we will be consumed in such a way as to be hurt. Now, again, we've been declared righteous. We've been made righteous. We are in Christ. So sin will not in any way separate us from God and his love, but it can certainly affect our experience and those around us um, and what we see. Uh, the law of the harvest is true. That which a man sows, he also one day will reap. Uh, that has not passed away. That idea in, our, in our, today, like our experience today, that idea has not passed away, though we've been declared righteous. Um, and so I bring that forward to like, let's, let's be eyes open about what sin is and the battle we face against indwelling sin that we're about to see portrayed in an even heavier way in the back half of seven. Chapter seven, starting verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. So here Paul again is referring back to the law, saying, hey, did did the law bring death to me? No. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now, excuse me, so now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Boy, what a divided conversation there, right? And you guys ever have that one before? Ah, I know I shouldn't do this, but I just, I just can't s stop. What am I doing? You ever that conversation in the mirror? Like, what? What's going on? 
I don't think there's a one of us in here who would say, no, once I learned what I should do, I was just fine. <laughs> there's a lot of debate, again, about who Paul is trying to personify in this conversation. Some say, hey, well, he wrote it present tense. He's probably just talking about who he is right then, you know, AD 58, follower of Christ, been rocking Jesus for a couple decades, and he's still battling sin. Now, I'm not saying that in the time he wrote this, he was not still finding that he battled indwelling sin. Wouldn't say that at all. But I don't know if we can characterize this passage as Paul saying, hey, in my present day experience, this is where I'm at. Um, I'll give one example of why I think that's an issue. In verse 14, he speaks of whoever he's personifying being sold under sin. And if that is true, then we've got some issues with what he wrote just one chapter before in chapter 6. When he spoke of once you are declared righteous and made righteous by grace through faith, you have been set freed from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So trying to believe that Paul is, is trying to speak of the same person in the same place in these two areas isn't is going to work. So some have said, all right, so if it's not Paul's present experience, maybe it's a, like it's, it's, it's a non-believer, someone who knows nothing of God, who's off the map, who's kind of moral in their own right, but is just far away from God. Challenge with that is I'm not sure Paul would say that that person is going to, in their inner being, call the law spiritual. So if that's not the case then, another option is Paul could be speaking of the experience of an Old Testament Jew. One who had grown up delighting in the law, who had the law, who understood that God gave the law and it was good to be followed, had, had understood the history of Israel that when we followed the law, there's blessing. And when we strayed, there was curse. That knew in their history that disobedience to the law and forsaking the Lord and worshiping other things brought exile and captivity and a whole lot of despair. I think it, I think it fits. But I don't want to say that this section doesn't have something that, that we can take from it because it's for an Old Testament Jew. But, but before I go on, we should consider the context of who Paul's writing to. Remember that whole divide going on in the house churches there in Rome? He's got Gentiles and Jews together. He's got, he's got a mix of folks who, they're all trying to follow Jesus, but they're kind of coming about it from different backgrounds. And a real center point of Jewish culture and community was adherence to the law for acceptance before God. Was if I just study the law, if we put it, if I, if I bind it to my forehead, I won't forget it, and I'll, st- I'll walk in it, and we'll figure this out, and we'll be made righteous. And what I think Paul wants all of his hearers to understand is that trying to look at a set of rules to make you righteous is going to lead you to being so divided that you're just going to cry out, I'm just wretched. Can't do it. That there's no liberation from sin by simply having a bunch of rules. And that God didn't design it that way. He didn't design the list of rules to be the avenue by which now we bear fruit and live a life that reflects God. That wasn't going to work for Paul's readers of this in the first century. It's not going to work for us today. I mean, who of you have seen, if you have kids, that the more rules you put on the wall for your kids, the better their behavior becomes? Because the list of rules doesn't touch the heart. And we saw it in the video that the prophets spoke of it. They spoke of one day when the Lord would come, a Messiah would come, who would fulfill the law and who would lead his people in fulfillment of the law, not by correcting their behavior, but by giving them a new heart and by indwelling them with his spirit. And so for us today, my hope is not that we would take being declared righteous and understand, hey, I've been, I've been loved by God, that's great. And then leaving here to say, you know what, now I'm going to be more like Jesus, so let me look at my calendar, and I'm going to do this, 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 and I'm going to do this. And if I get all those things done, I'll be more like Jesus. Because I think we'll find ourselves right back with the, uh, the Danny that he talked about last week, and kind of the frustrated Danny, and right alongside Paul's personification of the wretched man right here if that's what we try to do. When Jesus spoke to his disciples about how it is that they, in connection with him, would bear fruit, 
he didn't tell them, well, just, okay, now go and, and study up a little bit more and go do this and go do that. And they went, and then you will bear fruit. What he told them, we see really in a beautiful way in John 15 when Jesus said, hey, I'm the vine and you're the branches. You who remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you will do nothing. You can do nothing. I work in agriculture, so I love these types of examples because I understand where the source of all life in those branches is. Now, if you've got a vineyard near your house or if you've grown some grapes, you understand that it's, it's the branch off of the main vine. That's where the fruit is formed. But if I break that branch off of the vine, it dies because it has no ability in and of itself to sustain itself, to pull nutrients, to pull water, to do anything. It is completely reliant on its connection to the vine and being close to the vine. And that's the picture Jesus gave his disciples. What is it going to look like, Lord, for us to be made righteous, for us to bear fruit? Which basically is another way of saying, like to have come out of us the very reflection of Jesus that can carry to others the seeds of the kingdoms to replicate this stuff. We want the seeds of the kingdom to go out. We want this to spread, Lord. This good news has to spread. How do we do it? It wasn't the, okay, here's, here's your book on evangelism and whatnot and, and go. It was, no, you, you stick with me. And then even when he, when he knew he was leaving, and he was telling his disciples, he said, hey, I'm going to send you one. I'm going to send you my spirit now. So that when you want to be with me, like you, you, you just understand that I'm giving you my spirit to bring back to remembrance what I've taught you and to aid you in coming to the Father even when you don't have words, when you don't know how. And that's the same promise for us. How are we made righteous? It's by drawing close to him. Now, admittedly, drawing close to him may look like some of the checklists that you would have put in your life if you're trying to be a rule follower. Because I do think that spending time in your word is absolutely paramount to drawing close to Jesus. Because I think that is the clearest and most convenient and easiest place to hear him speak. And to see how he lived. To understand, what, it, what Lord, what would you do in this situation? How, how, should I, how should I respond? But also, Lord, when I'm overcome by anxiety, what would you say to me, Lord? Over the last year, I've dealt with anxiety and fear at a level I had um, never experienced before. Um, some matters involving, um, involving work. And um, I, it's just so vivid in my mind a night when I got a phone call with some news that just left me numb sitting on my couch that, again, the Lord just said, open my word and listen to me. And I opened to the book of Psalms and read in Psalm 34. And the Lord in that spoke to me the very words I needed to hear to calm my anxiety and to reassure me he was... He was for me. He was my shield. He was my refuge. And also gave me some takeaways for how then when I went to the office tomorrow, I was to respond. But I felt comforted in his word. I felt comforted in his word. Because I, I, I just, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is just abide in me. Abide in me. Abide in me. My last little takeaway before we go is to return uh, again, to the topic of the law. I, I don't know if you would say um, that the, uh, the Mosaic law is a center point of your devotional time. I, I'm not sure if many of you would say, hey, you know what? Yeah, almost every morning I, I jump into Deuteronomy. I jump into Exodus. Like that's, I'm, 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 full, I'm full go. It gets, gets me going. Um, but I want to encourage you again to think of the law differently. For, for many of us and for many of Paul's hearers, the law would have been a spotlight to their shame. It's exposing me. I don't, I don't want to read you shall not covet to start my day. Like, I want to encourage you, though, that when you're declared righteous by the work of another and you are made righteous as he indwells you with his spirit, the law no longer has to be a spotlight to your shame. It can actually be the definition of victory. Because Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law. And so Jesus himself in his life was living out a reflection of what it was to fulfill that which God commanded. And so for us now, when we look at the law of Moses, we look at the Mosaic law, it doesn't have to be, oh, I can't follow it. It can actually be a, Lord, I know you desire this of me. Dig in my heart. Make me like this. You can actually look square on at, at shortcoming without fear of condemnation, but with expectancy that God is going to help move you that direction. So you can open up to the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And versus being like, ah, oh, I coveted. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's a, Lord, you, you don't want me to desire that which you don't have for me. So, Lord, work in my heart. Where am I doing this, Lord? You can open up to the first commandment. 
You should know other gods. Okay, Lord, where do I have idols made up that are challenging you for a place in my heart? Let's work on that. And then maybe weeks later, you go back there, you're like, you know what, Lord, I see you doing that. You're doing that, Lord. You've dealt with my idols, or you're dealing with my idols. It's a process. And so I would encourage you to think of the law differently. That the law can actually be a beautiful thing when you go back and study that which God called his people to be. Because that is what God is transforming us into. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you are not just good, not just powerful, but that you're close and that you're present. I thank you that you desire for us to abide in you. And you say that in that you will also abide and be in us. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit that we don't battle as a divided person who has no ability to be sanctified because we can't pull up our bootstraps high enough, we can't work hard enough, Lord. I thank you that you say by grace we were saved and by grace we're being transformed. And it's your work, not ours. You're asking us for faith. You're asking us to believe that you're big enough, that you're powerful enough, Lord. I pray that those words from Hebrews 1, Lord, would just rest with us as we leave here too. You are at the right hand of God, Jesus. What is there that you can't do? Who of us in here has an issue that you can't, Lord, lead us through? Who of us in here has failed so hard that your grace can't abound even more? None of us, Lord. None of us, Lord. Your grace is beyond sufficient, Lord, not only to save us, but to change us, Lord, and make us more like you. Do it, Father. Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. And I